reconnaissance plane. The pilotless U.S. aircraft was knocked out of the sky over the southern no-fly zone this morning near the city of Boston. And you tried to get foods that were representative of the time or were most popular at the time? Both. Both. I mean, we, we wanted to be a season. Oh, isn't it pretty? It looks like September. For the rest of your day, it'll be sunny, dry, pleasant. Michael Jordan has finally given some substance to those reports of a comeback. For the first time, he has publicly suggested that he's looking forward to a return to the NBA. It's early this Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, 2001. From the heart of New York City, on Fifth Avenue at Trump Plaza. World Trade Center, we understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages 
of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. Now that conflict has come, the only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. My fellow citizens, the danger is to our country and the world. Will be is going mad, we'll rushing it towards it. They've been pelting it with Carry stones. The, uh, the Marines are, are trying to hold them back a little bit, but generally letting them run through and, uh, and express their emotions. People are jumping up and down on top of the statue on the ground, their arms raised in the air. It is an incredibly symbolic moment for the people of Iraq. Saddam Hussein's regime has been held in place by symbols like this. I was a sophomore in high school at the time. I remember being in gym class and my teacher wheeling out a, a TV on a, a big metal stand with wheels on it. And in the middle of the basketball court in the gym, we watched this footage of these planes flying into these towers that I had never seen before. The significance of those events, I think they, they shaped my generation more than we're actually really aware. It's crazy to think that the last September was the 15 year anniversary of those two towers falling. So much changed that day. So much is different now. What's happened over the last number of months? It's been a, an incredible season. It's been a, a difficult season, a devastating season. It's been painful. It's been encouraging. It's been it's been a whirlwind of emotions and experiences of incredible highs and lows and engaging here amidst this this great conflict, this great war. It's been a burden, but it's also been a great privilege. It's a season I'll never forget. On September 11th last year, we we began making preparations for the Mosul offensive. We knew the war was coming. We knew the assault was coming to to push the Islamic State out of Mosul, or rather to eradicate the Islamic State from Mosul. We began making preparations for ministry that would bear witness of the goodness of God in the face of Jesus throughout the military campaign, whenever it started. We didn't know when it was going to start. We didn't know how long it was going to go for, but we knew that it was coming. We sat down and, and began to knock out a plan of how we could engage and serve, particularly the Kurdish people, in a in the most meaningful, redemptive way that, that we could. And one of the most meaningful and redemptive ways was to bind ourselves to our neighbors. Our neighbors here are all Peshmerga or are all related to someone in the Peshmerga. 
the hopes and the fears of this nation and this people really are resting in the Peshmerga. And it wasn't that we wanted to serve a military per se, it's that we wanted to love our neighbors. You know, oftentimes we hear in, you know, the the, the jargon in, in church that, you know, God wants to meet people where they're at. You know, he wants to meet sinners where they're at. But what happens if the people that you're called to minister to are in war and have faced genocide? How do you meet them where they're at if we aren't willing to enter into the context in which they live? And so early on we realized that we couldn't just love and minister to the Kurdish people without loving and ministering to the Kurdish Peshmerga. So right now uh, we are unpackaging all the medical equipment. Just go through, do an inventory check. Um, kind of feels like Christmas. But, um, just seeing what we've got, making sure we've got enough of what we've got, and um, just get to know the kits. Main things we're using are uh, tourniquets, blood clotting gauze since it will rapidly clot, and then we have IV start kits. We have airway. We have pretty much the best of the best stuff here so we can show up and actually have something to offer these guys. We have a lot of equipment that we're going to be distributing to people who are going to be getting trained. The Lord is gracious and He's generous and He gives you what you need and more. It's, I'm a little bit lost for words now. I just This is unreal. This is unreal. I, uh, I'm eager to see Him glorified through this. I really am. So right now we've uh, given our translator a, a quick little briefing so he can uh, sort of figure out how best to um, convert it from English into Kurdish. Um, he's, he feels pretty confident at it and it looks like it's going well. Um, I think they're going to be quite receptive to the training already. You can tell that they seem to be quite happy that you know people are investing into them. So pretty eager to see how this one goes. Um, and it'll be a great way to gauge how much we can... Um, partner with them in the future, so it'll be a great day for everyone, I think. Okay, as long as you know, you know that you're going to reach field hospital in 20 minutes, because if you have formed that clot, so you have this on, say, 20 minutes, and a clot has formed in the artery, and you go and loosen the cat. We are watching these crates. Medics from the U.S. train these Peshmerga soldiers how to give basic medical care just to try to keep them alive until they can get to the hospital. And, uh, so they're doing a great job of showing them exactly what to do and then they're making each one of them do it so that they can be sure they've got it down. Why are you here? I'm here because we want to support the work generally, um, both both in the short term, uh, trying to bring medical personnel over um, who will come and help, hopefully in the very near future when the offensive starts uh, and the need will be great. They're gonna, they're, their need is going to multiply many, many times, and so hopefully we can help in the short term. Um, long-term building relationships with uh, these people who are so honored by uh, the society at large. Um, by building relationships with them, we'll have uh, it will be uh, better, to, easier to build relationships with people throughout the whole area. Another person with you. You get them to put the pressure on. But the important thing is, if you are in a firefight, you need to put lead down range. If they are shooting at you, there is no use you putting pressure on it and you doing the bandage. Meanwhile, 
They've shot you. So, having a situational awareness is very important. Okay. We have this incredible opportunity right now um, in this this particular time in history to literally go into other, into every part of the world. And this part of the world is so oppressed. The people have been so oppressed. And what an incredible opportunity uh, for us as Christians to come in and just demonstrate uh, the love of Christ, to demonstrate um, Christ's love for them in very practical, meaningful ways uh, so that as a result, uh, they will begin to see Christ in us through our actions. Then, prayerfully, they will, they will have ears to hear the words. Um, but it's, it's Christ's love in action first. Sometimes being a friend means sipping tea in a Kurdish living room because, I mean, the Kurds are the, some of the most hospitable people on this earth. So a lot of time spent with them will be in their homes, having meals, having tea. What I'm saying is it's not our strategies that matter most, it's, it's being there. Whether, we're, whether, whether that's at war or at lunch, being with Kurdish people. We got word from our friends in the Peshmerga that the offensive was going to be starting. They basically said on such and such a day, we're going to be rolling out and to be ready. So as a team, it was a, it was a few days, you know, uh, kind of this lull, this calm before the storm type of feeling. As a team, we, we really spent a lot of time in prayer, really seeking the Lord, hearing His heart. And during that time as well, we went to a lot of picnics. And in Kurdistan, where there's picnics, there's lots of food, and there's guns. The closer that we approach the return of Jesus, the more that both natural and man-made disasters are exploding throughout the nations. And this is opening up a new series of opportunities, and it's going to require a different model of missions and a different kind of missionary. A missionary is no less courageous than missionaries of the past, but often missionaries who are willing to plunge themselves into situations that are often quite a bit more chaotic. You know, there's about over a, over a million refugees inside Mosul at the moment. And so when the siege is imposed and the civilian exodus begins, northern Iraq is going to be flooded with refugees. And so our attention and our, uh, our focus is going to shift in the winter months from serving primarily in a, a, a combat capacity with Peshmerga on a medical level. It's going to shift, though we'll continue to do that, it's going to shift to IDPs and to civilians and people who've been displaced and are going to start filling up these villages and towns just outside of Mosul under Peshmerga control. These victory signs are just before the operation to take back ISIL's last stronghold in Iraq. Iraqi forces backed by Kurdish Peshmerga and volunteers have begun their advance towards the city of Mosul. The time of victory has come and hereby we announce the start of the offensive to retake the city of Mosul. We announce the start of the heroic operations to liberate you from the tyranny and the brutality of ISIL. Late at night, government helicopters dropped leaflets asking people to avoid ISIL locations and to assure them that civilians won't be targeted. Mosul's been under ISIL control for more than two years. Iraq's second largest city is strategic as it connects to Syria in the west and leads to Turkey in the north. And that's caused complications. 
The Iraqis, Kurds, Turks and Shia militias all agree that ISIL needs to be defeated. But the question of who goes in and what comes next has been divisive. This morning when I woke up, I rolled over and grabbed my phone to, to check what time it was and saw that it was October 17th this morning and, and saw uh, you know, a whole slew of notifications that the uh, in the middle of the night, the Iraqi Prime Minister officially declared that the Mosul operation had begun. Um, we just met with some of the Peshmerga soldiers behind us there. Um, and we're just assessing the situation, finding out what our small organization can do to help. You can hear the jets flying over. We've heard some explosions um, just before. So it's a sobering, uh, sobering atmosphere. There's a lot, of, a lot of hazy darkness because of the fires being lit in Mosul. Um, so it's, it's a very bad Monday for ISIS. You can hear the jets just over the hill here. Um, the, the airstrikes are, are happening. And it's, I mean, Mosul's just, just over the hill. We're about 20 kilometers from the city center. So it's, uh, it's, it's on. out to the front so we're getting a plated vest for him here before we take him out. So there's these little Peshmerga stores all over. Every little town and village has, has one of these. You can see the plume clouds in the, in the distance from the airstrikes because mostly at the moment they're doing uh, staging campaigns so they're doing uh, airstrikes around the city to kind of crowd the militants into certain places and they're also uh, moving ground forces in towards Mosul to kind of hem them in and cut off the only way they can go now to try to escape is to head towards Raqqa to go towards Syria it's exciting that ISIS would be defeated but it's also quite terrifying as well because of what this represents for the region um, once they're out of the way. It's going to create a, a vacuum. It's going to create a, a situation for ethnic conflict, for national conflict. Um, so I think we're all feeling happy on, on, one, on one level and on another level we're feeling uh, you know, sobered by what could be you know, as a uh, as time goes on. question at this point is, over the next few months, what does the future hold for, for northern Iraq, for Syria, for the Levant, for the Middle East, for the region, and the nations of the earth as we begin to move into the post-ISIS phase in terms of the, the driving out of the Islamic State from Iraq and pushing them into Syria and crowding them into and trying to contain this, this hemorrhaging conflict. represents. It's the last big city uh, between the Peshmerga front lines and, and the gates of Mosul. So in order to actually make the advance on the city, they're going to have to take, they're going to have to take Bashika. And Bashika is a, uh, 
it's going to be a we're expecting it to be a high casualty day um, we're expecting it to be a, a difficult day we're praying that it's not um, but in light of how dug in uh, isis is here we are not we're not expecting it to be an easier light day the unit that we're uh, serving today is actually a, a local unit from our, our town so it's it's our it's literally our neighbors and our, our friends and our um, people who become become like brothers and fathers to us here. Um, it's it's them who are going into making the advance today. We hope we don't have to use the ambulance today, and we hope the medics just sit around all day. That's our prayer, um, and that they can actually take the city. Uh, we're prepared in the event that it goes a different way, but we're hoping we're hoping for a, a bad day for ISIS and a, a quiet day for us. The battle for Bashika really had two pulses. You know, there, there were the big, uh, the big push was, you know, October 2021, and then November 7, 8, and 9. And those two pushes were the high casualty days. There was a lot of, a lot of deaths. Now, the offensive starts in two minutes. They're already starting to fire mortars. But this is the, the middle of the line. So out right is one flank, and then the left is the other side. So we're trying to decide now which way, which way we're going to go. We're going to follow the ambulance out. We had a pretty heavy morning. The first casualty, the first death that we know of was in our ambulance with our medic. The second one was, was our uh, our translator actually pulled the body out of the truck. So the Peshmerga went into Bashika while the coalition air force uh, did airstrikes to give them cover. So there was a, a couple waves of, of casualties. It was pretty bad. All of the casualties so far are from uh, from our town, the town that we're living in, and uh, we 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 know them and we know their families. Uh, in fact, our, our our translator, who's helping us, um, who pulled the first one out, he he knew he knew uh, the the first the first brother who died. Um, so it was a, a sobering morning. He you know we. We all rushed in to, to pull him out of the truck, and, and he said, I, I know this guy, I know him. And he, sa he said his name, and we lifted his body into the, the ambulance. Jesus, I come. Into I remember driving out to a village one day after one of the mass casualty days when we were back in Saran, driving out to a village out by Iran 
uh, for a funeral for one of the young men who was killed. And it was without question the hardest day that I've had since living here. It was, it was hard. I remember driving back just feeling anger and feeling hatred and feeling pain. Um, feeling like I wanted to just leave. I don't want to be here anymore. Like this isn't, I don't, I don't want to feel this. And the Lord challenged me on the way back. And, and I felt that he was inviting me uh, into something related to, to human misery that it, it is sharing with him in his burden. Feeling human pain and trauma to such a degree that you just you just want to disappear. You just want to get away. You just want to get away from it all. Be done with it. And I think it's good for Christians to be put in places like that because it forces us to face God in ways that we would never otherwise face Him, which causes us to see things about Him and cherish things about Him and, and the, the anchor of the hope of the good news of the gospel in ways that we never would see it without it. I, that was one of the, the worst days of my life, but it was also uh, one of the most fruitful, I, I think, from an eternal perspective because of what it wrought in me and is continuing to, to produce in me as, as the days go on. Told into the peace of thy sheltering fold, ever thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to thee, my Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come to Thee, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come to Thee. The last few days um, out on the front have been quite intense. Um, a lot of uh, sporadic mortar fire uh, coming towards us. Um, the outskirts of Mosul have been uh, under airstrike, I mean, almost 24 seven. There's a, a pause here and there, but for the most part, it's been quite bombarded. Um, we were at a, uh, a position on the front about 10 kilometers from where we've been stationed. Um, we've got a call about 11 o'clock at night um, that 500 refugees have es had escaped um, a town under ISIS control. Um, so we uh, loaded up the cars, uh, went out there, and sure enough, when we got there, um, there were about 500 women, uh, older men, women, children, um, and fighting age males, all mixed together. And there is that degree of <laughs> nervousness amongst everyone there. And um, it's just a stressful time. Um, but very rewarding nonetheless. The feeling on the front now is um, is good. It's a very good feeling, um, I would say, for the most part. Um, so far it's been a success, but um, there's some pretty heavy, heavy days ahead of us, no, no doubt. Tomorrow, we're gonna head out to the front to meet with uh, Peshmerga leadership and the, uh, the head guy who oversees the, the, medical, uh, the medical infrastructure of the Peshmerga to uh, talk through taking over a position on the front to serve uh, the Peshmerga for this next phase of the campaign. I feel like we may get crushed in the process because of how, how, how big of a task it is, but I think, it's, a, um, I think it's, it's worth the crushing to try. In a lot of Western countries in general, it's almost like an entitlement, like healthcare can be an entitlement, emergency services can be an entitlement. Even with the military, it's just, it's expected that when something goes wrong, you have someone who's automatically gonna be there within such a short period of time and everything is gonna be okay. At least that's the, the general feeling. But here in, in Kurdistan and with the, with the Peshmerga and the Kurds, it's, there's, they don't have that sort of thing. It's not really existent. I mean, there are some ambulances, but when you have a couple ambulances for an entire couple hundred miles of front line, it's, it's really not 
logistically possible to treat people uh, in an effective way. So I've had it on my heart for a number of years to want to be able to serve people with the skills that I have uh, as a medical provider and a medical professional in places where they're unable to actually have access to that on a normal, regular basis. This will start tomorrow morning, so we're setting up two tents here, one for fatalities, one for casualties, and then we're going to have sleeping over here. These guys in this village have let us set up here, so there's Peshmerga and the houses around, and uh, they've offered their hospitality. So this tent that we're about to set up, hopefully we won't have to use tomorrow, um, but the last heavy day of casualties we had a number dead on arrival so we need to have one tent that's just for fatalities and one that's for for injuries that are treatable and then we're gonna have a helicopter extraction point on the road over there to not kick up dirt and dust so uh, that'll be the most urgent cases we'll get airlifted and then injuries that we can uh, treat pre-hospital will be in this tent fatalities will be here you can, you, you can finish doing it. This guy just came here. He said, if you need any helping, we are ready to help My you. My name is Jagar. Our family. Jagar? Yes. Jagar. Dalton. Yes. Nice to meet you. Thank you for offering to help. Mm -hmm. He's strong. He's strong. Yeah. Help. Stick, uh -huh. around. Stick around. Help us. Yeah. We're going to put together a tent. You want to help? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah, where's your camping permit? Yeah. So this is going to be a sleeping tent where our team will will stay at night. We've also got these buildings over here, these abandoned buildings that we can use. Um, and they've actually, the Peshmerga have actually, the, the villagers here have offered that we could just actually stay in their houses. So this is Kurdish hospitality at its finest. Things are happening here. Uh, the ISF is, you know, is is moving, you know, uh, and pressing into into Mosul for the liberation, and and things are really happening here. And there's uh, IDPs uh, flooding out of the city. There's a lot of needs on a lot of levels. November 2016, then I decided to come out for an initial six weeks where, uh, where the FAI crew was like, hey, do you want to come? Do you want to help uh, set up a CCP, a casualty collection point? That, which means that basically it's located right after the, uh, right behind the front line um, of the military forces, liberating villages from ISIS presence and the wounded soldiers and, uh, and uh, you know, wounded civilians that come out of out of those villages, uh, they need care and they need immediate medical care. Do you want to come out and help pioneer that? So I got on a plane uh, about <laughs> 16 hours later after I got my yes from the Lord and uh, flew over to Iraq and got picked up from the airport and we went straight out to, um, to a little hillside about 10 kilometers outside of the little town of Bashika, which at that point was being liberated from its ISIS presence by the Peshmerga forces. Still copy the head corn dog? So right now we're heading out to the front staging area. Uh, we're gonna set up the ambulance at the CCP up there. So effectively what they'll do, if everything goes according to plan, is bring the casualties to us, usually in the back of a pickup. We'll stabilize them as best as possible and then uh, organize uh, transportation back to the field hospital it's probably a 10 minute drive basic first aid is sort of non-existent out here um, so getting to the patient as early as possible is always the best best thing to do and out here it's just it's not that easy so getting us as close uh, to the fight as possible is a necessity so that's why we're driving all the way out here at the moment
Uh, we're just moving up with the convoy now. Um, I think we're about five clicks out from Bashka at the moment, so moving at snail's pace at the moment. But you know, slow and steady wins the race. I think after after the other day, I think everyone went in a little bit gun ho. So they're just being, being very cautious today. It's probably a good plan. So yeah, just waiting, sit and wait. Murger just over the berm right there. That road there is leading over to the right to the entrance of the city over there. <laughs> no Bashika. No Bashika. Center Bashika. Center Bashika. You're going in. I'm happy to stage up there. Okay. Yeah, that way if we do have to gun it, we can. Whereas before, it was sort of in between a rock and a really bad place to be. Yeah. So I'm much, much more happy up here. Okay. We'll stay here until we absolutely have to go. Okay. You down with that? Yeah, totally. Your call. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Flat tire on the front. Not a great idea. The the roads. We'll turn the camera. We'll turn the camera around here in a second. The roads are all marked with IEDs and some of the IEDs aren't marked. The way the column goes in, one by one, there, there's no point to, there's no place to do a U-turn or a three-point turn or a pass because if you get off the road, chances are you're gonna drive on a mine or an IED. Yesterday was a day of heavy airstrikes. Today, the ground forces moved in and, and we hope finished the job. So we're going to go in now and see. There's markers all over the side of the road here of IEDs. Let's see the red flags here. Oh. So not exactly secure. So this is it. This is the city we've been looking at for the last couple of months from the berm. Wondering what it looks like on the inside. And finally, we get to go in. Smoke clearing over there. Right now the Peshmerga are sweeping house to house and we've been told there's three militants on this street and so they're sweeping trying to find them. My heart is so for the Lord. Uh, Jesus is my King and He is truly everything to me. And I'm, I just want to be at a place where He says, I want you to go here or I want you to go there or I want you to stay put. Then nothing else matters at that point. It's just what He says. It's me hearing the voice of my Father and hearing the voice of his son who is being obedient to his voice. And I get such joy out of serving my father and just serving the call that uh, Christ has asked us to do. And, and yet we can, do it in the, we can do it in the States, we can do it in first world countries and in easier places, that's all, that's all great and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I think the call is out there for so many people to go to the hardest and darkest places of the world and to serve. But the, 
the call is just not answered, whether it's because of fear or uh, just the impracticality of resources to get yourself from one place to the other. But God is so good. If we just are obedient to him, everything opens up. And that's like my ultimate desire is, Lord, whatever you have me do, I'm going to trust that if you have a specific plan for my life, then you are going to make it happen. You're going to take care of all the logistics, all the planning. Uh, all I have to do is be obedient to whatever it is that you ask me to do. Right now we're going into an ISIS house. These are the tunnels that they've been living and surviving in in Bashika and Mosul. It's like the West Bank, it's like Hamas. So this, this over here is one house. This over here is a separate house. And then they've broken the wall of partition down between the houses and then made tunnels down here and made bunkers, made bunkers inside. Inside here. Uh, he's on TNT. TNT vest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it could probably be confusing for some people watching on from a distance from the outside wondering what we're doing in the middle of a war that is not our war you know this I didn't grow up here this is not my this is my home this isn't my homeland um, and it could have the appearance of you know Christian militia kind of a thing and you know that is the farthest thing from what is in our hearts you know our our, our ambition being here is to is to preserve life it's to save life it is to nurture life it's to cherish life and so you know when we engage in you know this this whole arena of of military ministry in a military context ministry in a conflict zone our aim is is, is not for war lust you know this is not the war is is hellish it's awful there's nothing glorious about it there's nothing there's nothing awesome about it. ISIS walkie talkie. Looks like there's a firefight on the next street over. We were going house to house, looking at the tunnel system. And about to roll out with the convoy to the next the next road. Seeing what it's cost our neighbors, seeing seeing the funerals and the how how many sons and fathers have been buried here in just our little town of Saran, just in the last two two and a half years because of ISIS is is there's nothing glamorous or romantic or, or wonderful about war. It's awful. And the way that we engage it is 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 empathy and it, it's evangelism. And what I mean by evangelism is we, we bear witness to the goodness of God and the goodness of God in the gospel as we go. Our aim is to come in and to assist them in a medical and relief capacity, is to love them, is to be their friends, more than to even provide medical assistance. It's just to be there with them, to weep with them, to grieve with them, to mourn with them, to go to funerals with them, to love them, to hold them. And I think at the end of the day, this, this is more about friendship than it is about projects or ministries or, or service or things. At the end of the day, this is about friendship. This is about showing you're, you're worth it. You're worth it for us to just be here with you. Jesus said in the last days, wars and rumors of wars will engulf the nations. Chaos is going to sweep across the earth in the last days. I mean, the scriptures are clear. Well, if that's the case, then I think it's, it's really far past high time that the global missions movement begins preparing for that reality. If the Lord's heart burns for those who are needy, forgotten, in distress, a suffered loss, hated, forgotten, marginalized, I mean, this is the consistent testimony of the scriptures throughout the prophets then we who are his followers, we who are uh, seeking to demonstrate his heart to the earth, that's where we need to be. And this is, I believe in many ways, this is the future of the global Christian missions movement. We're going to be serving and ministering right smack dab in the middle of crisis zone. Body right there. Body right there.
trying to get out before the sun sets because the, the column that we were following is from a different uh, their their base is actually on the other side of Ashika from where we are so we're trying to get out before it gets dark because it's believed and assumed that there are still militants inside ISIS was in that building this building this building that building fourth person that building and they were shooting as this way and once we got in the city and turned around they stopped shooting because we came behind him with all the armor right, right down this street right here and they stopped and went probably into the tunnels so there's tunnels all over i went into every tunnel i found to the very some of them went out the other street none of them i mean i checked them for explosives some dead ended they weren't done yet i we got the big jack hammer at the end of every tunnel is a jack hammer if it's not complete and then there's complete ones that go underneath and pop up at different places Anyways, after we checked all that, then we went to these houses one by one. And there's a brand new motorcycle ISIS probably used two days ago. Wow. No dust, oil, everything, keys and ignition. Jeez. But you're here somewhere. Yeah. And like, who's shooting that? That's, that's an AK. That's not a machine gun. It's probably not Peshmerga because they're all in their vehicles. One night, uh, after a really high casualty day, there's a lot of deaths, and all the deaths that day were from our town and surrounding. We were sitting around the fire one night with uh, one of the generals, and, and the general said something that really uh, impacted me and, and stuck with me. He said, he said, we really appreciate you guys helping us in a, in a medical way. And he, he told us how many people our ambulance had pulled out that day and how many people we were able to, to save and to, to assist and to extract and to get to the hospital and to do triage. He, he told, because he, he got the numbers from the, the Peshmerga Medical Ministry and we, we found out and he was telling us and he was saying thank you. And he said, you know, the, the thing is, it's not actually, the most meaningful thing to us is not that you, you did medical stuff. The, most, the thing that matters the most to us is that you're here and that you're our friends and that you're not leaving. And I think more than anything, I want to be friends to the Kurdish people. I don't, I don't want, they're not a project. And I don't want to pioneer projects for them. I want to be their friends because they don't have, they don't have friends. And seeing what they've endured, Seeing what they've suffered and what they're they're gonna suffer in the years to come, my my desire my desire is to, is to show them the kind of friendship that God has shown us in His Son. And I'm not a project to Jesus. He, he loves me and He's my friend, and He He's He's not afraid to tell me. Call me his brother, it says in Hebrews 2. He loves me as a friend and as a brother. I don't feel like I'm his project. I don't feel like I'm something that he's, he's, you know, he's working on. Um, he's not doing it to stroke his ego, to work on me. He's not doing it out of pity. He, he does, he's doing it out of love and friendship. And I think that's the way the Lord wants us to engage the region. Is from a place of friendship, a place of empathy, feeling what they feel and being with them in what they're going through. And I don't think we we can come into that and make these people a project and build ministries the way we would build an earthly empire, an earthly kingdom. We need to come in as servants and we need to come in as friends. We need to love them with the love of Jesus, which is going to require a capacity for empathy that I think can only be born of the Holy Spirit. It can only be born of God. 
And so I, I think strategies are so peripheral. I think we, when we're looking at Iraq and looking at Syria, strategies are peripheral. I think what we should be doing is seeking the Lord and saying, God, give us empathy, give us compassion. Let us feel what you feel and let the wonder and the glory of who the man Jesus is touch us so deeply that there is no sacrifice so great and that there is no human misery that's too intense for us to engage in that we could actually engage in it and it not destroy us because we have this treasure in jesus and we can endure anything because of that christians more than anyone should be in the darkest places not to stroke our own fractured broken egos but because jesus would go there that's what he's like Dave Eubank, Free Burma, Free Kurd Rangers. Thank God that we're here and thank our Kurdish friends to make this possible and other friends like FAI that have helped us a lot and helped these people. So right here are about 500 people that fled Mosul yesterday. And ISIS told them, if you come to the Kurds, if we don't catch you, the Kurds will behead you. And they said, we'd rather die with the Kurds then. And they came here yesterday. So with the help of other friends, including Barzani Foundation, we had blankets, food, and water, enough to feed everybody last night. We did a medical treatment, and then we spent the night here with them. And then this morning, we were with them, trying to help them get out. And the Peshmerga and Asayish are making a plan for that. And then we are able to feed them again. This is a, a supply of food and water that has already been given to every family, and hopefully they can move tonight. But these are only a few of the thousands of people fleeing ISIS right now. And this is the, the new front line. This is a trench. In fact, um, ISIS have been killed in this trench as they try to escape out of Bashika. And ISIS suicide vehicles have been stopped by this trench coming this way. This is the new border also of Kurdistan, right here. And we thank, thank you all for helping us medically, spiritually, physically, materially, in every way. And God bless you all. Biji Kurdistan, Biji Kurdmerga. Billy? Oh man. Sweating. Sweating like crazy. Uh, packing up the medical clinic, uh, as in the, the CCP. Pretty set up to, to relocate and basically ready to go and help care for people. As per usual, you gotta pack it up, you gotta clean it up, you gotta organize it, because only then you can be quick to respond and set it up elsewhere again. Over this past week, uh, we just got a lot of uh, a lot of stuff given, donated, or bought medication. We just saw that uh, if we want to be able to respond quickly and be efficient, we just got to organize, especially as we move. So, I've been basically working and getting everything organized in the system, you know, with trying to take out like the really technical medical language, so that. You know, also people that are not necessarily medically trained like myself can really serve the ones that are medically trained. And so we're doing, you know, like, I mean, we're looking at labels like, you know, cough, cold, allergy, airway stuff, you know, or section creams and ointments, you know, or basic wound care, you know, when people come, want to be able to think like, hey, they got a cut, they got a scratch. What if there's a group of refugees that come from Mosul and they've just got minor wounds. So you don't have to dig through all this stuff, you know, you can just, Grab a box, has all the essentials in it, you know. When it comes to painkillers, you grab that box. So it becomes a system that's manageable for everybody. I think what you often see in these settings is that there's one person who has it all up in their brain. They know how it's run and they know how to roll with it. But then uh, 
when that person gets taken out of the game or when that person is not around, the whole system fails. And so simplifying processes, bringing organization, clear communication and really keeping things sealed so that, you know, for hygiene purposes so that we don't waste anything. I think we just, yeah, we'll be good stewards of all the individual pieces, but also good stewards of human resources and good stewards of, of the CCP that God has given us. Here we are in uh, Bashika. We just arrived with our trucks and our stuff. Uh, this is the command center here where the general staying. Uh, we just had a meeting with him, uh, and basically we got a we got a big okay for the plans that we have, uh, which means that we're gonna crash at his place uh, for the night at the command post here, uh, and then tomorrow they'll find us a house uh, where we can set up camp uh, for a base camp here in Bashika, which will hopefully be a, a long-term involvement where we'll be able to uh, basically set ourselves up, have a 24-7 presence there, medics, uh, people that can coordinate, have supplies there. And from there, um, outcome of the conversation we just had with the general was that he's very keen on us doing uh, medical work, both with uh, Peshmerga's, uh, Peshmerga soldiers and IDPs and civilians, because civilians are actually coming back into the town, uh, but also uh, heading out to the berm with them to be there as IDPs are coming uh, are coming in, uh, fleeing Mosul. Um, and at the same time, he also asked us to actually do some medical checkups for the people that are out there, the Peshmerga on the front line. So we've got uh, plenty of opportunity here. The doors are opening. We're focusing on getting ourselves set up as soon as possible, getting people out here uh, and we'll be operational within the next 12 to 24 hours, ready uh, to do whatever needs um, to be done. I don't know which vehicle they're in, so I'm gonna need the keys for all the vehicles. Well, at least some of them are still on the table. I've got the, uh, I've got the patrol key. I've got, got the, the eye of the tiger. It's not the same song. <laughs> I've got, is that not it? <laughs> <laughs> I've got the eye of the tiger. No, <laughs> I've got the eye of the tiger. It's <laughs> not how it goes. <laughs> one of them is a classic rock song, and one of them is like a pop song, right? I know, but I think one of them is like. There's two eye of the tiger. Eye of the tiger. Da, 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 oh yeah. Yeah. That's right. You are somewhere very much <laughs> in between. <laughs> I don't know what was going on there. Anyway, who's got the other keys for the <laughs> Probably uh, Tamar. Maybe. <laughs> Tamar went home. <laughs> He's like, oh, I got the ambulance. No, I don't think I need this one, but it will take it in. We are uh, right in the smack dab middle of Bashika. And we've been having a great time actually with, uh, with the general here. Um, we are, we arrived earlier and they weren't quite ready for us. So we are waiting until tomorrow to get a location where we can set up our shop. But for now we're sleeping at the, at the HQ at the headquarters where we've been hanging out with the general all day. I'm going to be sleeping on my bed, <laughs> my comfortable bed here. Everybody else is going to be sleeping on the uncomfortable cots. <laughs> How do you I'm feel be... about the condition of our human resources? <laughs> human resources? How do you feel about the condition of our human resources? We have human resources? Is that what you said? Our human resources are great. <laughs> really? This is a nice sleeping bag. Yeah, it's brand new. Is it? No poison ivy in this one. My <laughs> <laughs> poison ivy's gone. Oh. Well, we probably can get you some. Yeah. Or any kind of other rest. The only thing I have to worry about on the floor directly is scorpions. Because there are actually scorpions here. So as long as I'm bungled up tight in my sleeping bag, I shouldn't have a problem. Oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 Getting rid of all the stuff just getting rid of the stuff that was in the house 
trying to clean it up. It's just such a such a surreal situation cleaning up a house that ISIS has been embedded in. It's just real surreal. But we're gonna get it cleaned out and uh, get it set up to use. So it's a pretty nice place once it gets cleaned up. We want to get rid of this ISIS blanket. It's foul. It represents death. That was to cover the window, man. I don't care. Anything that has had the ISIS way. hands on it is going to get cleansed out. You need another flashlight? He's asking for a flashlight. Okay. I'll see for that one. That looks warm. Sweet, so this is going to be our uh, base of operations. Uh, as you can see, we have a little bit of work to get done on it, uh, but it has incredible potential, and we're super grateful that Dilshad spotted this place. It's actually one of the few places that has most windows still intact. This here is going to be our office space. The guys are going to sleep in here um, during the night, and then we'll make this storage. We're going to set up shelving here to store our medicine and medical supplies. So we'll be able to be mobile because just out the window here, which you probably won't be able to see, but just out the window with an eyesight is the, is the front line border between Kurdistan, Bashika, and, and Mosul. So as refugees are fleeing, as they leave the city and come here, um, we'll be able to respond within minutes out there and it's starting to get cold winter is setting in so um, food water medical attention blankets and then we'll be able to operate here during the day so we can treat Peshmerga during the day we can treat IDPs and refugees and civilians from nearby villages and towns uh, that have recently been liberated who need medical attention and who haven't had any yet so they'll be able to come here we're gonna set up some tents in the front front area over here And right now our team is, uh, is cleaning up and moving all of the ISIS stuff out of the house. I got some ISIS makeup over here. Uh, America is military is here in, a, in an advisory role. And there goes some advice. <laughs> this is an outpost for militants during the conflict. The place was rigged with TNT and IEDs, but the, the IED team has cleared it and our, one of the guys on our team actually snipped, snipped, the, uh, snipped the IED cable. I'll go show you the, 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 the marking on the, the front door. So, there she is, there's their office. Somehow, we, uh, we can't figure out how to close this table. It came folded, put it in the car, we unfolded it, ate lunch, really good lunch, and then look, we can't figure it out. <laughs> how many Kurds and Americans does it take to fold a table? We still don't know. Hey, what happened? What? A Dutchie! It takes a Dutch person! Yesterday, the Shiite militias sealed off the Tel Aviv uh, Shingal Road, which means there's no... That's the last, uh, oh, big airstrike. Yeah. That was the, the last road. Yeah, so that's that road from Tel Aviv to Shingal is the last uh, supply route for, for Daesh. So there is a desert road out. Uh, but there's not an, a, an actual official road. So with that sealed off, 
Mm. We are this close to a full siege being imposed, which means you can only live inside for so long under those conditions. So we're probably going to start seeing a lot of um, people migration this way as the consequences and impact of that siege begins to bear down on the city. Yeah. Uh, the numbers right now of refugees are way lower than what everybody anticipated. Um, and that's because they, they've been able to hold out. But they're not going to be able to hold out for very much longer. So we're hoping it, it's a sustained trickle so that we can deal with it. Because if it's a mass migration, it's going to be a security nightmare. It's going to be a humanitarian nightmare. Um, it's going to be a military nightmare. So we're praying that it doesn't, there isn't a sudden wave and an exodus out because that will cripple. It'll cripple everybody from the large top heavy organizations to the small ones. So we need help from the Lord to know how to position in these weeks before uh, it begins to get worse. Most up to date uh, Peshmerga front line, you see the berm. And we're actually beyond the berm at the moment. Bashika is in the distance where you have our headquarters, our base of operations. Um, we're here today, just witnessed a, a number of small little groups, uh, some, some, some groups of family members of IDPs arriving. The village there is not, is not declared safe just yet, but there are people from the outskirts and the surrounding villages that come uh, to this area. <laughs> Today we came down here to the front and uh, a group of families have just come out from nearby villages and there's about 25 kids and about more than half of them have fevers and, and coughs and colds and are, are, are pretty sick. It's, it's cold here now. Uh, winter setting in and the numbers are starting to escalate of people coming out and so most of the people in this group were were little kiddos like like these guys so we've got our medical team here uh, treating them at the moment um, but we definitely need more people to help you guys and we need more we need more uh, we need more finances to be able to purchase medicine food and water you walk to, to the bathroom there's like space on the staircase we can make some shelves there and yeah, have like 400 amoxicillin here, have another 5,000 and back up there. Okay. So what all those are going to this, are you thinking this will be? We're going to set up for midterm to long term. Giving permission okay. yeah. to be able that's to... How, that's, how we're, that's what we're aiming for in our setup. I'll go ahead and put a variety of antibiotics in this one and then this can... We're glad these kids are alive. We're glad these kids made it out. We're glad, glad they're smiling. These families have, have walked from their villages all day. They get here, and then when they get here, they set up shop in these tents while they get screened for security. And then while they're being screened, we check them out and to make sure they're healthy. And we get doctors among them to check and see if there's any sick, diseased, injuries, bleeding, um, seeing dehydration, malnutrition, a lot of colds, winter's setting in, so the immune systems are tanking. Um, and then we're taking them one by one across the security line. This ditch right here is the security line. So we take them across the ditch and because they're not technically screened yet by the security forces. So we will uh, treat them before and during their being, before and during their screening process. And then we can treat them there while they're waiting uh, to be screened. And then they'll be bused to the larger camps later. So we're basically just providing uh, emergency care in that gap between escaping from Mosul in the desert to the time that they get picked up and bused to a camp. So this is Barb here. Barb has been treating somewhere between 50 and 75 Peshmerga soldiers a day in our walk-in clinic. And then after a full day in the clinic, she comes out here 
and is treating civilians who are coming out of Mosul. I'm a nurse, an RN from the States, and I started um, in Africa and did some nursing there. But it wasn't enough for me. I needed uh, a more of a challenge. When I start operating out of my own medical head, instead of when the Lord comes in and gives you his compassion and his love, you will be undone. And there was several times when I had to turn and walk away and just grieve with the Lord, actually, because it was his heart. He's looking for somebody to share in his sufferings, and I believe that's part of his sufferings. We want to keep doing this dual focus. We want to serve the Peshmerga. We also want to serve civilians coming out. Some days it's really civilian heavy, some days it's really Peshmerga heavy. So and we also have a 24-7 emergency clinic set up in the event of a mass casualty, either a, uh, uh, an attack or uh, someone steps on an IED or uh, a vehicle hits a roadside bomb, we're available to do emergency medical response. It's such a hard place for these guys. There was one of the generals who became a friend and we'd had meals with him and laughed with him and shared with him. And I walked in and I saw this man that was so heavy and just, I mean, burdened. And I did start to cry a little bit because I saw my friend that was so heavily burdened. So these, these men carry such a great load and Kurdistan in general have been persecuted and pummeled for years one of the men that we worked with, um, he's 45 years old and he said he's only known two years out of his 45 years that, that he's had peace. And again, it's the Lord's compassion that, that comes in and gives you everything you need to minister to them. And so I really believe that we are the fragrance of Christ in that place. We, we have a lot to bring to the table as Christians in these war-torn areas. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, I love when you're inside of a bombshell. Merry Christmas from Kurdistan. Two months ago, we were staring at the city from the other side of this hill over here. We were looking down on this city, seeing the black flags of ISIS flying, and now, you know, we've got a field hospital established, and we're preparing to be able to serve people coming out, and ISIS is being diminished. It's in, it's pretty incredible to watch, uh, to watch this from, you know, from within the main uh, Peshmerga military hub. The bond of unity amongst the ones that have had the honor of doing a life with, you know, that there's this, this unity of like, this sense of unity of we've, we're laying down our lives together and we're gaining so much more in return. So what the general has asked of us is that we would provide medical care, trauma medical care for um, the IDPs who are coming out of Mosul when the bombardment begins because 
there's a number of phases to the Mosul Offensive. The first phase one was essentially liberating the northeastern, southeastern rim of the city so that they could push into the city. And so that's been done. So phase two is has, is, has officially begun, um, but they haven't actually put their hand to the plow, so to speak. It's been declared phase two is now underway, but uh, it's probably going to kick off here in uh, a week, two weeks, three weeks. We don't know, but January is going to be pretty intense. So we are bracing for a massive influx of refugees, and we're bracing for a, uh, um, a pretty uh, traumatizing season for the civilians inside Mosul. So we are out here at a CCP outside of Mosul. They just had two squads roll in with six patients in them. And uh, all of them had blast injuries from a V-bed that hit right out front of the house. We all had trap metal or glass in their face and eyes, arms. One of the ladies had two broken legs. Um, definitely a huge need for more gear, more equipment. Um, they had about 50 patients come through yesterday with the same scenarios, burning through a lot of gauze, sand splints, just about every type of um, equipment you could think of. <laughs> The last two weeks has been a lot of logistics, a lot of doing paperwork for the permissions that we need in order to get um, access. access, thank you, yeah. to both the Iraqi side and areas in the Kurdistan region. Um, so that requires a lot of paperwork, a lot of logistics. We've also been um, trying to get more vehicles, trying to work on outfitting our vehicles so that they're ready to go for the spring and mud and weather and the summer. Um, we're also praying really hard into getting more vehicles. We have teams that want to come in, and we need pe vehicles to move people, vehicles to move supplies, vehicles to move. Um, if we need to respond quickly, I'm working on getting some medical clinics set up even farther out towards uh, Sinjar, uh, Sununi area up near Syria. I know, but now I'm, I've turned around and I'm going back. And I see a sign for um, Tal Yara. You know, like Paige was saying, we're praying hard for um, resources, for friendships, for access, all of that. You know, I don't think we could do anything here without friendships and access. And so we were praying hard into that and um, kind of developing more friendships and more partnerships with other local um, medic groups and uh, physicians. So we'll be working hard on that so we can continue to augment them and bless them. We were just talking about how you know there's a real ministry in that being able to augment local physicians, being able to augment the um, local medic teams and be able to take them medicine and supplies and to love on them and help them in their time of need as they try to help the refugees and the, um, and the IDPs, people that are displaced, these communities that are so distressed. So from them, we'll be able to help with that too. So we'll be able to take in lots of supplies and start blessing people in Shingal with all the other stuff that we've been doing here for the refugees coming out of Mosul. Or no, it says it says right to Tal Yara, because I turn around and I'm going the other way. So right now there's a huge need for the vehicles and they are a lifeline for us. The teams that are coming in, the places that we're going, <laughs> they're, they've turned into a lifeline to have good vehicles that we can outfit to really get in and get out safely into places and to know that out of this vehicle we can operate and function and be self-sufficient. There's no, live, there's you know, no, there's just live out, live out, of, out of it. Yeah, there's no tow truck driver coming to yeah. bail us out. You know, there's right. no, so it, it's really important. And yeah, so it's mm -hmm. that two by two. Dalton always talks about the Hudson Taylor two by two model and looking more like two by two vehicles. You know, three yeah. by three vehicles going into areas 
really distressed areas, really difficult to access areas. So. Nah, man, I appreciate it. I didn't want it up in the wrong town, man. <laughs> we got two medics and then uh, Dalton's with us. So. We're super excited. We love the connections that the war has given us here in this country with the, the people and um, even just local staff that we work with. Um, we feel so honored to be able to work with them and to live with them and yeah. to love on them and to share to with share them. with them <laughs> and it's yeah. been incredible to, to see the Lord the, the Lord open doors into people's lives and hearts just by just by yeah. being here and serving and being who we are and being really honest and open about yeah. who we are and just um, having real conversations yeah. with people it's been it's been an incredible journey and so as the church we really need to take a perspective um, yeah, take on a perspective and, and develop a theology that requires going and not just going to hand out packages of food and bottles of water and to put band-aids on wounds and all those things are important, they're incredibly important, but this is the most, one of the most under, uh, unevangelized regions of the world and the gospel needs to come here, it needs to come back here, it was here and it needs to, we need to go back here and we need to, we need to sow our lives in this region. We need the church to pray and intercede. I've, I've seen you know this past year you know like people really st starting to get burdened for for prayer uh, in place of prayer for the Middle East and especially for the nation of Iraq and Syria and it just makes me so excited because I'm like that is where things will start to change and shift and as we pray and as we intercede I think God is gonna give us a burden to go because whenever we pray God will challenge us and hold us accountable to be the answers to that prayer and um, then suddenly it becomes a matter of obedience and responsibility. Will we go? Will we, as we have connected with the heartbeat of God, to see, especially these two nations of, you know, Iraq, Iraq and Syria, to see them restored. Like my heart got burdened for it because I prayed and now I can't go back. <laughs> I can't go back from that. So here we are 15 years later, and you know something? This nation needs, um, needs engagement far more than it did 15 years ago. What is the Lord putting on your heart? How, how might you be involved? What might the Lord be calling you to, to use your professional skills, your training, your education, or just your passion? You know, I don't have particularly a lot of education and training myself. Um, but I believe that if Jesus was alive and on the earth today, there's a very strong chance that he just might be in Iraq, that he just might be in Syria. And so as a follower of Jesus, this is my heart. I want to follow him where I think he's leading me. If we are truly following Jesus, if we're looking out in the earth today and seeing if he was alive and walking on the earth, where would he be? And if we're followers of him, where is he leading us? As 2017 starts and we look back at the last 15 years since those two towers fell, looking forward to the next 15 years, you know, looking ahead this year and, 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 and plotting and scheming and praying and dreaming and asking the Lord what we should do and how we should do it and how we should pioneer here. And more and more I'm feeling it's not really about what we do, it's why we do it. And more than anything, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be successful. I want to be faithful. I want Jesus to be incredibly happy and delighted in the way that we represented him here. And I want to be better friends than mountains to these people. I want to be, I want to walk with them through fire because Jesus has walked with me through fire. And my fire has been different than theirs, but this is where he's called me. This is where he's called us. This is where he's calling many more. And I want to go with them. I want to walk with them through that fire. It's going to be costly. 
but I know it's going to be worth it. Jesus is He's the lily of the valley He's the bright and morning star He's the fairest of ten Everybody on.